In woodworking, there are various tips and tricks you can explore to further your knowledge. However, in my opinion, finding tips and tricks that are actually useful, then learning how to perform those tips and tricks using your tools, and then finding a project or a process you can actually implement that tip, it's quite difficult. I believe it is far more important to learn the principles and the fundamentals of any given process in woodworking. In this instance, planing, because understanding a process is far more effective than simply relying on memorization of some random techniques. I'll say now that this is not a video on how to sharpen a plane. It's not a video on how to set up a plane. It's a video on how to use a plane. And so with that, let's get into principle number one, which is stance. Let me say to you now, the following techniques will likely feel very alien and perhaps even robotic to you the first time you try them. You'll get into a position and you'll be like, come on, is this really necessary? Do I really have to get into this position? And my answer to that is no, but you'll find it a lot easier if you do. Right, so to begin with, we're going to look at something as simple as where you stand in relation to the wood you're working on. This is a lovely bit of beach and we have got a sharp and very well set up plane. And so if you're hoping to follow along with this video, but you don't have a sharp and well set up plane, fix it. If you need help, there is plenty of links in the description below. Now, the most common thing I see beginners do when picking up a plane for the first time is stand perpendicular to the wood like this and try and plane across their body. I haven't done this in a while. That's actually really difficult. When planing like this, not only does it make the grip incredibly uncomfortable, which we'll be talking about soon, but the amount of force it's putting on my body to twist it this way, which is the opposite way to unpushing, it's just completely unneeded. I can feel it in my spine. I can feel it in my obliques. It's very uncomfortable. Instead of standing straight onto the wood like this, you wanna step back a little bit, open up your body and get behind the plane. You'll notice my elbow, wrist and the plane itself are all in line. And that's gonna give me so much more power and control behind the cut. The other thing I'm doing here is letting my legs carry me through the cut. You'll see that my upper body stays locked in position. And my legs are doing all of the movement required. Now, of course, this is heavily dependent on the length of timber you're working on. If this is five foot long, you're not gonna be able to do the entire thing with your legs. So don't take this advice too literally. Don't think you need to do the entire thing with your legs. Just try and focus on it a little bit more than you already are. Because what we're trying to untrain here is this. Sure, it's quite good for rough material removal, but you're not gonna get a lot of accuracy from this if you're looking for accuracy. These problems won't manifest too much when you're working on a face. It's when you're working on an edge where they can really cause problems. This is because everyone has a natural tendency when planing. Some will scoop in like that, some will scoop out like that. Maybe not with a tilt, maybe it's just a directional thing instead, but there will be some sort of bias going on. My one is I tend to scoop in like this. And if, for example, we were trying to square up this edge and we've got a cambered blade, that's gonna cause this corner to start dipping off and I'm never gonna get a good finish. The way I fix that is by locking everything into my body and carry it through just with my legs. When I'm working on longer pieces of wood, this is where I'll opt for a combination of both legs and arm movements. Because if we just go for arm movements, I'm gonna be standing here and I've gotta reach all the way forward. And there was actually a bit in the middle there where I slipped. We can see it in the shaving here. Whereas if we go for a combination of both arms and legs, we start back like this, reach the limit of our leg movement and then finish off with the arms, much more controlled. So altogether, it looks like this. In fact, when I'm pushing through, I can feel my thumb scraping past my side and then it goes all the way up my wrist. And then as we get to the end, I can feel my elbow past me here. It's almost as if I'm using my body as a reference. So thumb, wrist, elbow, off. Now remember what I said at the start, don't be surprised if this feels uncomfortable to you because it will. But over time, you will relax into it and you'll start finding those movements a lot more natural than what they probably feel now. All right, next we're gonna start focusing on your grip because there are a number of things you can do to not only make this more comfortable, as you'd expect, but also more accurate as well. So starting with the absolute basics, a plane is designed to be held with your index finger pointed down the frog like that. In fact, there's a nice little area here that accepts your finger very nicely. So index finger pointed down there. However, for some people, that's still a little bit of a squish, myself included. Look at my little finger, it's all bunched up in there next to my ring finger and all that. I don't like that. So what I also do here is extend my pinky out like that. So it rests down the bottom of the handle here. I find that to be much more comfortable for 90% of operations. It's only when I'm really hogging off material that I might grip it like this. But no matter which one of those I choose, the index finger is always pointed down. For many of the same reasons that I discussed in my how to saw correctly video, it just helps to keep things tracking straight because you're literally pointing in the direction you want the plane to go. 
So we focused on things we can do with the backhand. Now let's start focusing on what we can do with the front. Now, if you're looking to just hog a bit of material off, a full fist grip like this is always going to be ideal. You just want to make sure you hold on. But what if you were looking to do some fine detailed work, such as squaring up an edge or planing a detail onto a corner? Let me show you. Now bear in mind, we've got a very subtle camber on this blade and we're gonna use that to our advantage to square up this edge. Let's say that this side is high and needs to be taken down. This one, we don't wanna touch it at all. Well, because we've got a camber, all we need to do is centralize the plane over this side of the material and it's gonna take off more here. So let's do that. As you can see, the shaving has tapered off to absolutely nothing on this side. So we've only taken material here. But did you notice what I did with my front hand then? You'll notice that instead of gripping it like this, I actually hooked my finger over the front edge of the plane. And the reason I do it over the front edge is because it's much harder to hit the blade. Some people grip it over the side like this, but that gets a little bit treacherous. I like to just do that because unless you've got very abnormally long fingers, you're gonna struggle to hit that, he says, almost hitting it. But what I'm doing here is using my finger as a fence. So what I'm doing is getting the plane in a position where I want, hooking my front finger over, locking it in place with my thumb here against the back of the front toe, and then that keeps the plane a consistent offset from the edge. This will feel very odd at first, I guarantee you, but the good thing about it is that it forces you to slow down. You have got to be careful doing this because there can sometimes be unfortunate pinch points where you catch your finger between the plane and the vise. So just make sure the material is elevated enough to give you clearance. And secondly, you've just got to be careful of this edge here because it could either give you splinters or it could get so sharp it could cut you. My finger's in a position where it just curves away from that corner, but from time to time, it does get you. So if I'm doing really heavy work, I'll hold the front toe with a full grip. If I'm doing very fine work, I'll usually hook my finger over the front like that and use it as a fence. What if I'm just doing general work? My advice would be to grip it somewhere down here. If you try and hold the handle like this, it can work, but it's quite top heavy and it's more likely to rock. Whereas something like this keeps the center of gravity really nice and low, and it can help keep everything nice and stable while you're planing. Because in reality, you shouldn't need a lot of pressure on the front of the plane to make it cut. As long as it's sharp, it will stay in the cut itself. So don't feel like that front hand needs to be there for anything other than general support. Planing shares a lot of similarities with sawing in the sense that it's very easy for beginners and experienced people alike to ask too much of the tool. For example, in sawing, people will push harder to make it cut quicker, but then there's a trade-off because the saw plate will bend and it will go off track. It's much the same with planing. People will like push down as hard as they can with the plane to keep it in the cut. And the trade-off to that is that your hands hurt, your body aches, and there's absolutely no need for it because chances are, it's just your plane isn't set up or it's not sharp. So we've talked a lot about stance. We've talked a lot about grip. Now let's talk about use. And we're gonna start with this. The reason I've waited this long to make the point I'm about to make is because I've wanted adequate time to trigger the people who don't like me putting a plane down on its sole. Because I'm sorry, but you're just wrong. The reason people say not to put a plane down on its sole is because it damages the blade. And it's like, sorry, but I'm about to slam this plane into a piece of end grain to take a shaving. The least of this thing's worries is me putting it down like this on my wooden workbench. This is an old maxim that's just been passed down through generations and generations of woodworkers. And it's always been very, very clear to me that that's the case, because as soon as you question someone on their logic, they're unable to give you a straight answer other than it damages the blade, and then you just bring up the argument I just made. But until recently, I wasn't actually aware of where this maxim originated, and I found out from a video that Paul Sellers put out. So before you say, what does a young person know? I've got Paul on my team, watch out. Or I should say that I'm on Paul's team. He's, he's definitely team captain, not me. Turns out it's just something that woodwork tutors used to teach their students to stop them putting the plane down on metal objects like this. Because if you put a plane down on its side, it can't hit the ruler, that's it. That's literally it. And then of course, those woodworking students go into industry and then maybe some of them become teachers. They then teach more woodworkers about this unbreakable protocol, not really giving solid evidence why it's unbreakable, but hey, why question the tutor? So then those people go on to then teach it and it just becomes this cycle that no one knows what they're saying anymore. And I'll tell you what, there are so many things in woodworking like this. I can't tell you the amount of times I've put a plane down during a demonstration like that and someone's walked up to me making full eye contact and turned it on its side. It's a joke. I feel like I've probably said enough about that now. If you want to see Paul Sellers video on it, 
link in the description. Anyway, now that rant's over and done with, next we're gonna look at grain direction. Now I'll be straight with you here. We're just gonna cover this on a surface level because this is an entirely new rabbit hole to explore. We'd need to explore so many areas such as different types of woods and different grinding angles in order to work with those woods. For the sake of this video, it's not worth going into that amount of depth, but what I'm about to share with you We'll cover about 90% of things anyway. So this is a bit of oak that I've already started planing, but just to show you, it's taking a shaving absolutely beautifully at the moment. We've got a really like glass-like finish going on here and it feels super smooth. But without changing the setting on the plane or anything, let's flip the wood around and try and do the exact same thing. Oh dear. Oh, I'm surprised it worked that well, to be honest. That is uh, not as smooth as it was before. Pretty fluffy. I'm going to flip it round and I'll do a shaving next to this one so we can compare them side by side. And there we go. The track on top is planing with the grain. The track on the bottom is planing against it. So now you've seen the difference side by side. What's actually going on here? This is called a featherboard and it's used to provide pressure on a workpiece while it's going through a machine or something like that. But it's gonna serve as a very good example for what happens with grain direction. This ruler is gonna represent the blade. And if we push that from this direction over the featherboard, it rides over pretty nicely. This is what we're referred to as planing with the grain. However, if we come from the other side, it starts getting stuck between each of those, let's call them fibers, because that's what we're representing here, and it starts levering them up. And obviously the harder I push with it, at some point they're gonna snap or break. Or in the case of wood fibers that are somewhat paper-like when you shave them away, they're gonna tear, tear out. This is where it comes from. You are literally tearing out those fibers if you're planing against the grain. That's what all of this light discoloration is along this side of the wood. It's very minor tear out. However, there are patches where we have got some proper tear out that you can feel. And this would be quite challenging to try and sand out. Now it's all very well being able to diagnose why tear out happens, but how do we predict it happening before it actually happens? Well, in much the same way as we can look at this featherboard and figure out which way it's best to push a ruler, across the top. If we look at the side of a piece of wood, you can see that the fibers are tracking up like this towards the top left corner if it's in this orientation, which conveniently is exactly the same direction as this featherboard. And so watch what happens to this cloudy area here when we plane with the grain. Gone. You may have noticed as I was entering the cut there, I got a little bit of vibration on the top edge. And again, if you look at the side grain here, it's actually hooking around this knot and coming back up like this, meaning I was temporarily planing against the grain here before then going with the grain. And that is where the rabbit hole begins. Dealing with variations like that requires all sorts of different things. If you're impatient, I've got a very old video that I'm planning on updating soon, which you can find in the description below. And if the new video is available, I'll put a link to that below as well. But just to hammer the point home, because it's such an important topic, we're gonna to look at one more example of planing with and against the grain. Because this time we're gonna focus on the edge of a piece of wood rather than the face. And speaking of the face, you can really see that tear out from entering the cut now. Horrible. So on this one, the grain is traveling up to the top right, which is in reverse. And I'm looking at it here. There is a bit here that's going up towards me to the top left. I suspect I'm gonna get a little bit of tear out there, but we'll see. Firstly, let's plane in the direction of the grain, working beautifully. And then let's plane against the grain. Ooh, not too bad, but it is catching at the end here. So although it's not as bad as the face, we definitely still got some tear out on the edge from planing against the grain. So hopefully you can see that by carefully examining the piece, you can quite easily predict where you're gonna get tear out. Now I will stress that this is not always the case. Sometimes you'll plane a wood in what looks like the direction of the grain, but it will begin tearing out. Wood is a natural material. It will play optical illusions on you. It will try to screw with you. And so if you do experience tear out, even though it looks like you're planing with the grain, just try it in the other direction. But 90% of the time, in fact, 95% of the time, 99, I don't know, identifying the direction of the grain using this method will give you a pretty accurate reading. Now that subject was quite in depth, so just to give you a little breather, here's a very quick tip. Here's a ramp of plywood and here's a plane. If you put the plane on there, it kind of gets stuck. However, if you scribble a little bit of candle wax on the bottom of the plane, not much, just a few squiggles here and there, and then put that back on the ramp, I was hoping it would go further. There we go. If you've got a lot of planing to do and you're finding it quite tiresome on your arms, 
Putting a bit of candle wax or paraffin wax on the sole of the plane can do wonders. I keep a bunch of it up here, stashed away for whenever I need it. All right, so I've just taken time to sharpen the plane and it is cutting beautifully once again. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about pressure. So we've already talked about the advantages of locking your arms into your body and letting your legs carry it through the cut. But what we haven't talked about yet is where to put pressure on the plane. Now this might seem obvious, but when you're starting a cut, you wanna make sure most of your pressure is on the front toe. We need a little bit at the back, but not too much because you don't want it to tip like this. This is a problem that a lot of beginners have because they're simply not assertive enough with the plane. When entering the cut, there's gonna be a little bit of vibration you experience and you need to hold it down while making that initial cut. That's what allows the blade to get engaged in the wood without chatter. However, after you've entered the cut, once your backhand is mostly over the material, you can almost completely remove pressure from the front. A good way to practice this is to literally take your front hand away when you're planing. So you'll notice with a plane that the back handle is tilted forward slightly. Use this to your advantage because you don't want to be pushing directly forward with this plane because that will lift it out of the cut and you won't actually get anywhere with it. You want to make sure you're pushing in the direction of the handle tilt, which is down into the wood. And that's where carrying it through with your legs can really help. So we've got it started and I'm pushing down into the wood with this backhand now. This will take some practice and you do need a sharp and very well set up plane to allow it to stay in the cut like it's doing. But if you're struggling to keep it engaged after you take your hand away from that front tote, just practice while carrying it through with your legs. Once your backhand's on there, just take most of the pressure off your front hand and you should find a comfortable pressure where you're transferring from front to back. Transferring pressure like this is often sold as a way to prevent you putting arcs in an edge that you're planing. But a plane does that regardless of whether you get the pressure right or not. For me, Transferring pressure is more about energy preservation. If you're putting full force on that plane through the entire cut, firstly, it's gonna start teetering when you enter the cut because you're putting as much pressure on the back as you are the front. And when you're in the cut, if you're pushing too much on the front, you're creating a lot of unnecessary downforce and drag. By the time the blade is engaged, the optimal position to push it in is perpendicular to the handle here, say at 30 degrees to the surface. Just pushing down at 90, it's not needed. Right, so one more topic to address. A question I'm very commonly asked is what is the difference between pushing a plane straight or skewing it? And let me tell you now, there is quite a big difference. So here we've got a blade which is mounted at 45 degrees to the surface below. Well, 44.8, there we go, 45 degrees. But watch what happens if we spin that gauge around to a skewed angle. It is now at 32 degrees or 33 degrees, let's say. What this tells us is that by skewing the plane, it lowers the cutting angle. Think of it this way. You've got a mountain in front of you and it's got a 45 degree slope to the summit. Well, you could try and walk directly up to the summit, but that's going to be traveling up a 45 degree slope. So what do most mountain path creators do? If that's a thing. Well, what they do is they do a zigzag path up to the summit instead of going straight up. Because by traversing across the slope instead of going directly up, you're lowering the incline. All it takes is a ruler on the blade to confirm this. At the moment, it's traveling up 45 degrees, but if I spin it around, look how low that angle is now, and it's still sitting perfectly flat on the blade. So what does this actually mean? Well, there are situations in which by lowering the cutting angle, you increase tear out, which means the flip side of that, the higher the angle, the less tear out you get. Now, again, this uncovers an entirely new rabbit hole to explore, which we're not gonna do in this video, but we're gonna cover enough for you to get a basic understanding of what to look out for. One thing that skewing the plane can be good for is reducing the resistance of the cut because it's shearing the wood fibers rather than just levering under them and pushing them up. For example, if I push through like that, it is incredibly easy. You get these lovely curly shavings from it as well. Much easier than going in straight. But that is only the case if you're planing with the grain like we're doing now. If I was to flip this round and plane against the grain while skewing it, I suspect we are gonna get some hideous tear out from this. I mean, you can just tell from these shavings to begin with, but there is tear out all over this now in places that we didn't manage to get it before. And again, it's very fortunate the plane is sharp because this could have been a lot worse, but you can see massive patches there, big patch there, all down here. This feels horrible. And so if you're planing a timber that is tearing out all over the place, 
the worst thing you can do is skew the plane even more because the blade is in an even better position to get under those fibers and start levering them up. It's actually better to increase the cutting angle either by swapping out the frog, putting on a back bevel, or by using a bevel up plane of some kind in which you can change the cutting angle. That's three quick tips that are completely out the scope of this video, but if you do want help with them, there's a link in the description. An instance that skewing the plane can be really useful is on end grain. If I just try and go in straight, Firstly, uh, it makes a horrible sound. Again, that's where a bit of candle wax can come in use. But instead of going in straight, let's slightly skew it. Instantly easier. And we're getting beautiful end grain shavings, being sure to apply plenty of pressure on the front tote as we enter the cut. And those are just pure end grain shavings right there. Another thing to keep in mind with skewing the plane when planing edges is that when you're going straight like this, you're using the entire length of the sole of the plane. If you start skewing it and hanging it off, I'm only using maybe about two thirds to three quarters of that or so, which can be handy if you've got a dip or something in the middle that you want to get to, because maybe this edge doesn't need to be perfectly flat and you're okay for it to ride those humps and bumps. But if you're looking to get a flat edge joint off of this, make sure you're going in perpendicular because that will give you the flatter edge. And then the final thing you can do to make your planing better and woodworking in general better is Go to mattesley.com forward slash shop and purchase a bit of merchandise because it helps support what I do and keeps these videos coming and helps improve your skills, hopefully. That's probably the worst sales pitch of my life. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to press the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.